Text Talks. Hello and welcome to Text Talks. Thank you for tuning in for our first proper full length podcast. And today we have got Hinduism and gender. Yeah, well, so we had quite a lot of requests for gender in Hinduism or Hinduism and feminism from teachers and students, which is great for me because this is what I study, this is what my PhD really, really focuses on. So much so that I'm going to actually split gender and Hinduism into two podcasts. So I'm going to do one today that's going to focus on goddesses and how we can look at those goddesses and compare them to the traditional roles of women. And then later in our podcast, I will revisit gender and look a little bit more about how those traditional roles have developed. Awesome. So let's get started. Yeah. So Katie... Where do we even start when we think about goddesses in Hinduism? I think we start with the traditional roles ascribed to women in Hinduism. So a lot of these goddesses are really, really ancient. You know, they've come from really old traditions. So we need to look at what those traditions said about women. So there are two main concepts I want to talk about here. The first one is Sri Dharma, and that means literally a woman's dharma. And dharma is something that you've probably come across already, and it means a duty or a law that you follow. So Sri Sri Dharma is a woman's dharma. And this often relates to a woman being a wife, a mother, a daughter. The other concept that is worth bringing up here is pativrata, which means the perfect wife or the ideal wife. And that relates to the idea that a wife should treat her husband like a god or like a lord and always vow herself to her husband. I'm not going to go into too much detail here because we actually have coming out very shortly a mini lecture by Dr Brian Black and he's going into going to go into a bit more detail about these two concepts of uh, the traditional roles of women Uh, and that's going to be really helpful for you to gain a little bit more understanding of those roles and some more textual examples. Oh, okay. So is there a goddess that is Pativrata? Yeah, there are lots of goddesses that would certainly be considered as Pativrata, so your perfect wife. Um, A great example is Lakshmi, who is sometimes also called Sri or Sri Lakshmi, you might see her as. And Lakshmi is a very famous goddess. She's beautiful. She's very calm, very serene. She's married to Vishnu, who Mm. is a really important god in Hinduism. And she generally is depicted alongside Vishnu as well. Often they're depicted together. Now, Lakshmi is a really ancient goddess. She initially appears in the Vedas. So there's a particular um, text in the Rig Veda called the Sri Sukta. And in that she's described and she's associated with all these different symbols. And that reveals a lot about her uh, personality and what she represents as a goddess. So she's depicted in the Sri Sukta uh, alongside a lotus, um, alongside some elephants, chariots, some horses, gold. And she's also depicted alongside cow dung. Right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Now, the lotus represents her beauty, but also her fertility. Uh, You know, kind of like a growing flower represents fertility. The elephants, chariots, horses, they all represent royalty. And any idea what the cow dung represents? (laughs) I have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) Don't want to fathom a guess. No, I don't. That actually represents good harvest, which makes a lot of sense because, you know, manure helps with um, growing, so good harvest actually relates really well to that. Makes sense. Yeah, so, yes, Lakshmi is a Pativrata. You know, she is depicted as this, like, really devoting wife to Vishnu, her husband, but also she's a lot of other things. You know, um, her relationship with royalty and the harvest that is that shows other sides to her character and this is something that Dr Brian Black talks about in a forthcoming book and he says that actually while we can find elements of the pativrata or um, very obediently following a street dharma in female characters they also do a lot of other stuff you know they don't just do 
that one thing they're not just an ideal wife you know it's silly to say that you can only be an ideal wife or you cannot be an ideal wife so Lakshmi certainly does have elements of that Patti Vrata but you know she's also got a lot else going on for her. They're more complicated characters. Exactly exactly uh, another really great example of that is Sarasvati and so she also represents a very peaceful serene beautiful wife she's married to Brahma so one of the other really important gods in Hinduism but she's actually the goddess of intellect art and music so she's got a lot going on for her and there's a really one of the reasons that she's associated with intellect is because she often mediates philosophical debates in ancient texts whoa yeah so there's a particular text called the Shankara Digvijaya and this in this text there's a debate between two philosophers, one called Shankara and one called Mundana. And they're having this really in-depth philosophical conversation and debate and argument. And they have, or Sarasvati comes and she mediates it and eventually chooses the winner. And how she chooses the winner is she places a garland around both of their necks. And the garland of the winning philosopher, Shankara, the garland stays in a beautiful full bloom, whereas for Mundana, his garland wilts to show that he has lost the philosophical debate and it was Sarasvati that decided that. Wow. So yeah, that's that's really interesting. And again, um, Dr. Black talks about this in relation to Draupadi from the Hindu epic, the Mahabharata. And he notes how she is described as both a pativrata and a pandita. A pandita means scholar. So she is both an ideal wife and a scholar. So that really shows how She's not just one thing, and it's the same with Sarasvati, same with Lakshmi. They're not just wife or not wife, you know, they have complex characters and it's reductive to say that it's one or the other. What do you mean by reductive? Reduct. so that is a good word, it's not reducing someone to be just one thing, so um, not reducing to something to say it's less than it is, so if I said, oh, you know, you're just a student you'd be like well no you know you're a lot more than that I'd like to think so <laughs> you know you're, you also do a lot of a lot of other things so it's reductive to say that you're just one thing so we shouldn't be reductive about these goddesses that also have you know they represent wealth and fertility and intellect and so you've talked about Lakshmi and Sarasvati are there any goddesses? Because I know that I've seen goddesses with swords and skulls and flames. <laughs> like, what's going on there? You, we're talking about this perfect wife ideal. Like, what's happening? Well, so yeah, you've also got the more, um, the warrior goddesses. So they're the goddesses that often appear to fight demons and, um, yeah, like conquer on the battlefield. And they're absolutely amazing. They're, they're great to read their stories. Uh they are also wives, it's worth pointing out. Um, so Kali, which is probably one of the most famous representations of the goddess in Hinduism, particularly in the West, is, you know, Kali, who's absolutely terrifying to look at. She's got long, dishevelled hair. She's got a garland of skulls around her neck. She's got severed arms as a skirt, um, fetuses for earrings. Yeah, the list goes on and she is terrifying. Uh, but she's also married to Shiva, and she's actually very devoted to Shiva. In the Linga Purana, for example, there's a story where Kali's just annihilated on the battlefield. She's just, you know, absolutely destroyed all the demons there. She's drinking their blood. She's juggling their heads. It's, yeah, it's a full <laughs> gory scene. Don't read it if you're squeamish. <laughs> Um, but then in her celebration, she's dancing and she's stamping on the world and she's actually dragging the world down into the netherworld. So she's going to destroy the whole world with her dancing. She's so like, you know, vehement with it. And so to try and save the world, the gods call upon her husband Shiva to stop her. And how Shiva does that, does this, is he lies beneath her feet and only when Kali realises that she's actually now stamping on Shiva does she stop and thus the world stops falling down and the world is saved so that does represent you know her kind of love of her husband you know she's not she's all these terrifying things and she's you know absolutely incredible on the battlefield but she also still loves her husband so that further shows how these goddesses at first you know you can think 
they're representing one particular thing. But no, you know, they have these complex characters and represent a lot about femininity. So it seems then from looking at these three characters that goddesses, although they're complex, and we understand that now, that they kind of still fall into two categories. More peaceful ones and warrior goddesses? Well... You say that, and yeah, you can definitely see that, but then they can be even more varied within themselves. So a you know, good way of looking at this is Dr. Black notes that in, this, in the character of Draupadi, she is varied. She's got a um, meek side, a savvy side, a subservient side. She can be defiant, she can be angry, she can be calm. Just as we can be every day. Like a normal human being. <laughs> exactly. When you wake up in the morning, you feel one way. In the middle of the day, you feel a different way. You know, it, it, you can vary within your character so much. And a really great example of this is the goddess of Durga. So this is another warrior goddess. Uh, and she's really popular. She's worshipped in Durga Puja, which is a festival based around the worship of her that's um, really important in especially in North India and what Durga Puja celebrates in particular is a particular story from the text the Devi Mahatmya. In this story Durga is summoned to the battlefield but she's not just summoned she is formed from the gods to conquer a evil demon called Mahisha so we have Shiva giving his face, Yama, the, uh, that's the god of death, giving his hair, Vishnu giving his arms, and the list goes on, and all the various gods give different parts of their body to create this absolutely formidable goddess who is um, going to be an amazing warrior, and she does, she goes on to slay Mahisha with all the weapons that the gods also give her. So... Again, similar to Carly, you know, a really scary, really terrifying goddess. Definitely, you know, would fit into that warrior goddess category you talked about. But she's also one of the most varied goddesses because she also has these nine incarnations or uh, manifestations or avatars. And these nine uh, images of Durga are called the Navdurga. And this really shows the diversity within one character and what Black, Dr. Black calls a polyphonic voice. So polyphonic means poly means many and phonic refers to voice. So that's the um, many voices of a particular character. And that's really shown here in Navdurga. Navdurga sorry. So some of the examples, um, one of her avatars is Shailputri who is a mother nature and daughter of the mountain. And you also have Brahma Charini, who represents asceticism and penance and is married to Shiva. But then you also have Skandamata, who is the goddess of fire. And wow. also, interestingly, the mother of Skanda, who is Ganesha's brother. So Ganesha, the elephant god, Ganesha's brother. And then you have... Katya Yani, who is known for her anger and wields all these weapons. You've got Chandra Ganta, who represents serenity, but is also prepared to wage war if the situation demands it. So there's variety within even one of these incarnations. And then you've got my personal favourite of um, Durga's incarnations, and possibly my favourite deity ever is Kalaratri, who is the most ferocious form of Durga. And considering you've already got a warrior goddess who's terrifying as she is, had to have a more ferocious incarnation <laughs> is... That's something, and she's just um, absolutely terrifying. She Her name literally means Night of Death. And when she manifests, she wreaks havoc on the battlefield and rides a donkey. Incredible. Um, <laughs> yeah, all the animal vehicles that these uh, incarnations ride are really interesting. It's worth having a look at, because they've all got a different animal that they ride. It's like Ganesh riding a mouse. Yes, like exactly. Yeah. You know, sometimes it can be surprising, but a donkey's a strong animal. There might be something to said there. I don't know. Uh, I've tried asking experts about this and no one can tell me thus far. So any theories? Yeah, if anyone's got any ideas about <laughs> why <me> Colour Archery <laughs> rides a donkey, then please send it in. Um, yeah, and you know, so there are nine 
manifestations of Durga and they are so varied and that really I think exemplifies how much these characters can represent different sides of femininity that you know when we talk about gender in any tradition there's a tendency to either assume that everything relates to these traditional roles like Sri Dharma and Pati Virata and those roles certainly you know can crop up and can be reflected in characters but just like any woman is or anyone is today these characters are varied and femininity is represented in many different ways okay so final question <laughs> given everything you've said are the goddesses of hinduism feminist that's that's a big question that's a really big question you know i think we have to be careful when it comes to the especially the word feminist it's something that i mean i've been wrestling with in my research and you know like when do you ascribe feminist to something like you know is it fair for us to call these ancient goddesses a word that we use in contemporary times you know are we ascribing or um posing certain things on them that they didn't weren't even aware of it's it's a tricky one but i think like i've said before about patty vrata um about being good wives or not we have to be careful about whether we put them in, they're either in a feminist box or they're in not a feminist box. You know, rather than looking at what they are, it's a bit easy to look at what they do. Mm -hmm. So when you look at these individual textual examples or certain character traits, you know, what does that represent and what are they doing there that might represent a feminist ideal or not? So, you know, a lot of the time they are really, really feminist and there are some really empowering things in here. I'm empowered by Carly and Carla Rachi, you know, they're, they're inspiring, interesting, um, powerful stories. But of course, there are also times that the roles of women are challenged and there are many examples of women really suffering and uh, often at the hands of a man. So there's a lot of variety in how these uh, goddesses are depicted, but there's definitely lots of arguments to say that they do lots of feminist things mm -hmm. and it's actually a really good introduction into our podcast because hinduism is nothing but diverse it everything you know you're going to be fighting to get a straight answer from me in these podcasts because every every question you'll ask i'll say well it depends on this <laughs> depends on that look at the story look at the tradition uh it's just such a diverse tradition but that's what makes it so interesting so yeah, there are just a few goddesses uh, and some really important goddesses from the Hindu tradition and how they relate to the um, concepts of Sri Dharma and Pativrata, sometimes challenging them, but not always, and how each goddess can have their own relationship with those more traditional roles. Next week in the Hinduism podcast, we're going to talk about Dharma. Dharma. This is something that... I work on a lot and I'll also be drawing from Dr. Black's research because he knows a lot about Dharma, has studied this for a very long time. So hopefully that'll be really interesting. And it's worth pointing out at this part of the show, we would usually do a question and answer session. Uh, but with this being the first pos podcast, we haven't got any questions <laughs> yet. Uh, but if you do have any questions leading up to Dharma or questions about this podcast, then please send them to us. And we will use this portion of the show to try and talk about those issues that you might be finding with your syllabuses. That's it. So our next Hinduism podcast will come out on next Wednesday. And we also have a Buddhism podcast <gasps> that Alex will be leading on Buddhism and the environment. And that will be released on Friday. We also have the resources coming out alongside these podcasts. So... Um, keep up with our social media and you'll get all the information as to where you can find those. So if you haven't already, please like us on Facebook at Text Talks, Twitter at Text Talks 1, Instagram at Text Talks 1, or email us at enquiry.texttalks at gmail.com. Thank you very much for listening. We hope you've enjoyed today's show and hope you join us next time. Yeah.